So what do we have here? A graphic from a new research note from Morgan Stanley with the label, four potential paths of collaboration for Detroit's auto companies to consider. I thought I'd start at the end of this note and work my way back. What we are looking at here, US-based legacy automotive companies, Ford, Government Motors and Stellantis, the big three, Morgan Stanley suggesting that it's potential that the US legacy automotive manufacturers could work with Tesla and China, e.g. battery manufacturers, electric vehicle manufacturers, suppliers, and EV startups could work both ways with the legacy, e.g. Rivian, Lucid, Fisker, and so on. And legacy auto companies in the US could work with other legacy auto companies, including US-based, and also some from Europe, e.g. the VW Group. As the saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures, and we've seen in less than the last year, practically every US-based, and I don't just mean founded in US or headquartered in US, but any company selling vehicles in the United States now has announced a partnership with Tesla. Adopting Tesla's aptly named North American Charging Standard, of course, when it was originally named that, Tesla was the only company using it, but they saw the writing on the wall, and now literally everyone's adopting it, and all agreeing for the same deal to access a portion of Tesla's charging network. So this is clearly already happening. The legacy is partnering with Tesla. We also heard from Tesla a while ago that they'd had some preliminary discussions with at least one large automotive manufacturer about potentially licensing FSD. By the way, at some point in time, this will happen there'll be many such partnerships there will also be partnerships i believe where legacy companies will actually license tesla's operating system potentially software for thermally managing their vehicles stuff behind the scenes as well now i don't know i don't have proof i haven't heard any inside information it just seems rather inevitable tesla's built a lot of incredible solutions that legacy automotive companies if they have any sense at all rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and doing a terrible job of it if they have any sense they'll just partner and or license from tesla i also want to emphasize that over time I believe Tesla will become a third-party battery supplier as well. It's going to take time, but Tesla's going to become one of the world's largest manufacturers of lithium-ion battery cells for their own needs, their vehicles, and their energy storage products. And why stop there? I also believe that due to optics, many of these companies may make slightly less than rational decisions about who to potentially partner with for certain technologies, simply to avoid the embarrassment of having to say we're licensing and or partnering and or borrowing and or copying from Tesla. Tesla draws a lot of eyeballs. Imagine your GM, just a hypothetical example, not the actual GM, but a pretend version of GM where the pretend version of GM had an incompetent leader who had colluded with the corrupt president of the United States to steal Tesla's valor and suggest that they'd led the EV revolution, who'd been touting your supposedly amazing, technologically advanced, brilliant Ultium battery platform. And then you realize that your supposedly incredible Ultium technology is actually horseshit. You realize it makes a lot more sense to just start buying batteries directly from Tesla, but you think, oh, that's going to be embarrassing. We don't want to, because we were saying that Ultium's incredible. And if, if we do that with Tesla, people are going to realize they're full of shit. So perhaps in a hypothetical situation like that, the pretend GM would go to a Chinese battery supplier instead and go, hey, you know, those 4680 cells that Tesla designed that you guys are now going to be making, can we buy them from you? It's also entirely possible. If a company decides, you know what, we kind of suck at making powertrains for electric vehicles. We want to license them from somebody else, but it's going to be embarrassing if we do that from Tesla because everyone's going to go, but aren't you an automotive expert? How come you can't do it? You thought that you were just a car company. Maybe instead they go to somebody like Lucid or Rivian and go, hey, can we license this tech from you? Less embarrassing once again. And ultimately, as the walls continue to close in, I think a lot of the legacy automotive manufacturers will realize they are headed for bankruptcy. Things are going to get desperate. We may even see some direct partnerships, acquisitions, mergers, collaborations. So just flagging that now. So that was the end. Let's get to the beginning. In this new research note from Morgan Stanley, the title, Trojan EV, Tesla, Mexico, and China. The US wants electric vehicles, but electric vehicle supply relies on China. China wants export markets, but confronts a rise in protectionism. Elon Musk wants way cheaper electric vehicles. So do consumers, but you need China for that. Mexico is in a powerful position to broker a westernized China-based EV supply chain. You can't have Western EVs without China. Western car companies have come to realize that mass electric vehicle adoption and China are inextricably linked. Strict trade barriers on China EV supply will mean far lower EV adoption in the West. Diversification from China comes at a price of cost and time. Onshoring electric vehicle and battery supply may take decades and will face a barrage of environmental and permitting impediments, e.g. lots of red tape and bureaucracy, and that is guaranteed. We are seeing real-time evidence of auto companies reaching across to work with China. Among a growing number of examples, we would highlight Ford's continued outreach to CATL for LFP batteries made in Michigan, Stellantis's investment in China's Leap Motor, 
A Volkswagen stake in Xpeng, Tesla's recent plan to open a US battery plant with equipment from CATL, and Elon Musk's invitation to Chinese suppliers to supply his Gigafactory in Monterrey, Mexico. Moreover, many legacy auto companies are exploring ways to use their existing China-based assets and joint venture partnerships to reverse export EVs to Western markets in a more economic way. Such are the advantages of the China EV industrial complex. As auto companies confront adverse change to the balance of EV supply and demand in the past year, we expect to see continued sponsorship of collaboration in many forms between Western OEMs and Chinese EV juggernauts like BYD. By forcing the issue on China EV supply, legacy OEMs will be in a better position to determine the timing and scope of their multi-decker billion dollar EV investments. A more localized supply buffer or bridge may be needed to overcome competing industrial and national security objectives. Mexican policymakers are trying to align themselves with US policy objectives and have recently introduced 25% tariffs on Chinese imports. If US EV strategy pivots, we believe Mexico would rapidly go from being a China buffer to a bridge for China. And here we see a Trojan horse. Given the ambiguities and loopholes embedded in the IRA Inflation Reduction Act, as it is currently written, EVs produced in Mexico with the help of Chinese equipment and industrial know-how offer a potentially viable, if somewhat uncomfortable, path to onshoring low-cost electric vehicles. Headlines today report that Chinese auto parts makers are racing to set up plants in Mexico to supply Tesla's next Gigafactory following CEO Elon Musk's invitation to replicate the local supply chain at Tesla's Shanghai Gigafactory. And yesterday, reported BYD is considering an EV plant in Mexico as an export hub to the US. We've been writing about the on-ramp to Chinese EV assets to the West, wherein China is seeking a more politically palatable on-ramp to the US, and Mexico as a conduit can make sense. I mean, this is super wordy, but what Morgan Stanley are getting at here, using Mexico as a Trojan horse to get Chinese produced and or predominantly made electric vehicles into the US. It's much more palatable to have them come from Mexico than from China directly, even though what they're essentially talking about here is Chinese companies setting up Chinese operations in Mexico with Chinese supply parts, components, potentially some labor as well, to produce vehicles in Mexico to be sold into the United States. And this does have very positive implications for consumers. Costs. Setting up EV supply chain and manufacturing in Mexico, predominantly China-based companies, setting up operations in Mexico, it's going to mean much more affordable electric vehicles for consumers in the US and potentially elsewhere too. There's nothing at all to stop companies, China-based companies, producing electric vehicles in Mexico in collaboration with US-based automotive manufacturers and exporting them elsewhere. Over the long run, this could actually be a huge, huge positive catalyst for the Mexican economy. And we could see a wave of economical electric vehicles flooding the world, not only from China, but also Mexico. For now, unless a potential Trump administration is able to roll back or push out incentives, by the way, spoiler alert, if Trump is elected, in my opinion, expect some brutal, brutal tariffs. Trump's policy in the past has been clearly protectionist, so I wouldn't be surprised if the Trump administration slaps whopping, obscene tariffs on electric vehicles and other vehicles coming from China to the US, from Mexico to the US and elsewhere. From a policy point of view, the reasoning behind this would be to help the US economy stimulate jobs in the US as opposed to stimulate jobs and economies outside the US. Our policy team believes that while IRA incentives are unlikely to be repealed entirely, particularly not the manufacturing tax credits as provisioned in Section 45X or sections that have already issued guidance like 30D. A potential Trump presidency could potentially set stricter FEOC and or critical mineral and or sourcing requirements. An interesting chart here. Sales of Chinese car parts made in Mexico to the US. So let's just make sure we got that. Chinese car parts made in Mexico sold in the US. So this is, this is what they're talking about with that Trojan horse, right? They're from China being put together in Mexico and then sold into the US. And notice, 2021, $710 million. 2022, $940 million. 2023, $1.08 billion. There's a very clear trend. Morgan Stanley have included some thoughts from a Latin American equity strategist. Mexico is over-indexed to the internal combustion engine. That is in a slower decline, but localized EV supply chains are a key factor in enabling Mexico to push low-cost technology to the shores of the US. Or if Detroit pivots more as a bridge to the US. So this is a bit nerdy, but my interpretation here is in terms of a bridge to the US, this would be in the form of those partnerships, joint ventures with some Chinese companies in Mexico, as opposed to not having the partnerships and having somebody else producing those products to sell in the US. 
Mexico seems to prioritize its relationship with the US. Their strategist observes that US policymakers are very active in Mexico trying to limit the China bridge narrative, and Mexico appears to be playing along. BYD and other Chinese manufacturing plants have been delayed for almost two years in Mexico, while Tesla got all permits within one month. So there is one data point suggesting that it's right. The speculation that Mexico is playing along with US interests by fucking over Chinese manufacturers, ch attempting to build plants, like delaying them by a couple of years, whereas Tesla gets all permits almost instantly. Completely unfair, but I do understand why. However, if Mexico comes to the realization that Detroit's industrialization of the EV supply chain via vertical integration is unlikely to pan out in the near future, they may ease efforts to appease US-China fears and consider diversification. In our view, the continued slowdown of EV demand, <laughs> God damn it! why do they keep saying this, bro? Oh. May cause legacy OEMs to look for new ways to spend less and or spread similar spending levels over higher combined volumes. Check this out. Ford and GM combined spend around six times that of Tesla on a per unit basis on electric vehicles. Six times, bro. We think partnerships will ultimately be deterministic for legacy OEMs and can come in many forms, working with startups, working with China, working with Tesla and working with each other. That leads us back to where we began, the graphic. So a few closing thoughts. Given how many years ahead in terms of scale, operations, technology, you name it, Tesla is versus every company outside of China. Tesla is highly vertically integrated. They control their destiny. Who was it that, what, a year ago announced a lithium refinery in Corpus Christi, Texas? That would be Tesla. Who was it in record time that built a gigantic, wholly owned factory, the first ever for a non-Chinese automotive manufacturer, previously everyone forced into a joint venture in China, had the red carpet rolled out, got below market rate financing for the factory. That would be Tesla back in 2019. Who today is already producing give or take 1 million electric vehicles per year in China and using that as an export hub and selling locally to Chinese consumers. That would be Tesla. And which region has the most advanced electric vehicle market with the most electric vehicles sold in that region per year? That would be China. It seems pretty obvious that Tesla and China will be building out global electric vehicle supply chains. And this speculation from Morgan Stanley regarding Mexico, I think it's completely on point. Tesla has essentially opened the floodgates by announcing the factory in Mexico and encouraging those who set up their Shanghai supply chain to do likewise in Mexico. It's very likely that Tesla is going to have a huge hand indirectly in helping companies like Ford's, Delantis, GM, even EV startups, to survive that little bit longer by doing more of their homework and more of the heavy lifting, allowing these companies to jump on. Now, I don't know exactly how this plays out, but I'm certain Morgan Stanley are onto something here in terms of partnerships. But I think it is going to come to a point where companies like Ford, Government Motors, realise they're headed for bankruptcy. They get desperate and they go, fuck it, what can we do here to survive? I know. <laughs> Let's stop making vehicles entirely. Let's just buy the skateboard from Tesla. Maybe we can just slap our badge on the back of it. You ever see a computer that said Intel inside? Exactly. I think this is going to be a gradual process. Initially, we'll hear partnerships for battery factories between Chinese companies and some of the legacy OEMs. A couple of years later, though, they start to get desperate. Like, fuck this, man. We need to scale back a little bit. I can see a future. I don't know exactly when. Where companies like Ford and GM are licensing software, probably from Tesla, unless they're too embarrassed to do that, and then they'll find somebody else for the operating system, for FSD or something similar, buying batteries from somebody else and or the entire skateboard, the entire drivetrain and have effectively become glorified window dressers, which isn't too far off the truth today. I've outsourced a lot anyway, but I think there is going to come a point as these companies are taking their final breaths where if you're to buy a Ford or a General Motors electric vehicle, the vast majority of technology inside Hardware and software is going to be coming from somebody else. And due to the financially unsustainable, huge compensation increases for UAW workers, I think companies like Ford and GM are going to be in a massive hurry to scale up operations in Mexico, which optically looks a lot better than directly in China with Chinese partners. Begin producing more and more vehicles in Mexico to export into the United States as opposed to building them locally. At the same time, however, as these companies are struggling to start scaling up operations in Mexico to lower their costs, the Chinese companies in China, already at massive scale, many of whom are actually making some money and fairly compelling, well-priced electric vehicles. Less Chinese imports are slapped with massive, massive tariffs. And I'm talking like 40, 50 plus percent, a flood of extremely compelling relative to what the companies in the US besides Tesla are making. Electric vehicles are going to be flooding into the US, eating the lunch of Ford, GM, Stellantis, and so on. Meaning that by the time they really get their operations up and running in Mexico, it's probably going to be too little, too late. That's when the mergers and acquisitions take place before the inevitable 
bankruptcy filings. Want more content? Early access? Bunch of perks? Click the links in the pinned comment. AG1 has given me a massive meaningful boost in energy, allowing me to do a lot more every day, including using my brain more and using my body more. I highly recommend you guys and girls check it out. It's an excellent way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's got 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients, plus prebiotics and probiotics and digestive enzymes and adaptogens to help you deal with stress. Plus, if you click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR, you can get yourself a one year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2. But don't take my word for it. Here's what some of you guys and girls have to say. AG1 has changed my life. I was, as you described, treating myself like a circus. I ate like trash, rarely exercised, used alcohol as a stress crutch, cannabis also. AG1 is what gave me the kick in the ass, got me back to the gym, motivated me to do more for myself, family, my business, etc. Keep doing what you do. Now, I know there's some skeptics, the same kind of people who think Elon Musk is a fraud, reading this going, what do you thought? There's no way that's possible, bro. It must be a placebo effect. Believe it or not, this is a recurring theme. If you give your body everything it needs to feel and perform its best, including having a lot more energy, you'll need ways to use that energy. For me personally, that includes more exercise, moving my body more, more social activity, and more cognitively demanding tasks, including producing a fuck ton of exclusive content over on Twitter and on Patreon, plus my daily YouTube uploads. The proof's in the pudding. On to another testimonial from a viewer of this channel. SMR, you asked me to provide feedback on AG1. Here it is. It has helped with mental acuity, stamina, and intestinal waste management. Uh, can't read between the lines. It certainly helps with regularity and digestion. That's what the digestive enzymes are for. It has also dramatically reduced my cravings for sugar. You guys need to stop eating sugar. It's fucking poison. I'm 50, 5'9", and overweight, aka a fat motherfucker. I think that's a technical term for overweight, isn't it? Is it fat motherfucker or obese? I can't remember. I average 100 hours a week in the West Texas oil fields as a safety supervisor. Jesus Christ, dude. No wonder you're struggling to keep your weight under control. 100 hours a week. Brutal. It has helped me lose weight. It is not an appetite suppressant. It can help fat people suppress cravings and motivation to be healthier is critical for changing your diet. Love you, brother. Again, this is a great point. It's something people really don't seem to grasp. If you have more energy, everything becomes easier. It's like turning on easy mode for life. A few years ago, before I was taking AG1, my health was trash. I was struggling to get through the day, had afternoon fatigue. The last thing I wanted to do was either use my brain or move my body. Didn't have the energy. Now, my biggest struggle every day is figuring out ways to use that energy. I'm exercising way more, doing a lot more with my friends and family, and of course, my work output has increased substantially. And you can fact check me. Check out the average length of my videos I was posting to YouTube three years ago. Need I say more? And one final testimonial. Love this one. Okay, here's the deal for me with this AG1 shit. I'm 41 years old and not the type to eat, drink, smoke, or sleep healthy, so I was skeptical. That being said, here's what I experienced. Day one, meh. Day two, afternoon fatigue was about 45 minutes late. Day three, zero afternoon fatigue. Day four, zero afternoon fatigue plus extra energy. Day five, again, zero afternoon fatigue plus energy. Wondering, what the fuck, really? See, this is the thing, right? The results for many people are just almost too good to be true. This, this is the same experience I had. My afternoon fatigue just vanished out of nowhere. I'm like, wait, what the fuck? Why am I not tired in the afternoons anymore? Surely, it's not that AG1, is it? Turns out it was. Day six and seven, same thing. Day eight, same thing. Plus, I had the want to get things done around the house that I normally would slack off and not get done. Again, the point, extra energy, you'll need to use it, you'll find ways to use it. Day 9, 10, and 11, and today is day 12. I fucking love it. So however you managed to get me to buy it, I'm so glad you did. Thank you so much, SMR. It really changed me so far. Guys, this shit really works. Just try it. By the way, this is the reason I continue to relentlessly promote AG1. A lot of people get real fucking mad in the comments. Oh my god, snake oil salmon sold out. Oh my god, he's a scammer. This is fraud. But Constantly... I'm pretty sure everyone making these comments is also currently short Tesla stock. I'm not particularly concerned about people having a negative perception, those folks suffering from small brain syndrome, still living in my bum's basement syndrome, etc., writing mean comments, claiming AG1's a scam or it doesn't work. I mean, bro, when I get feedback like this, this is what keeps me going. Just try this stuff for a month, and if you don't get these results, get your money back. See, it's a literal no-brainer. It's an IQ test at this point in time. Testimonial after testimonial after testimonial like this. Get your money back if it doesn't work. Just try it for a month, and if it doesn't work get your money back. Today's the day. It's finally time. Be like this guy who was a massive skeptic, but finally, after a thousand promotions in a row, caved in, tried AG1, and has results like this. Head to drinkag1.com slash SMR, or click the link at the pinned comment, and please, let me know how you're feeling in a few weeks' time. For now, if you'll excuse me, time to put my extra energy to good use. I'll be recording some more exclusive content for Patreon and my Twitter subscribers. So click the link at the pinned comment, see you over on Twitter and or Patreon, and don't forget to grab your AG1. Love ya.